I'm going to talk to you tonight about belief, specifically the problem of religious belief. Our, our world has been balkanized into, into separate moral communities. We have Christians against Muslims, against Jews. The, the, the majority of people on this planet at the moment organize their lives around a founding proposition that, that God wrote one of their books. We have many of these books on hand. They, they make genuinely incompatible claims about the nature of this universe, about the disposition of certain real estate in the Middle East. We have the marriage of quite literally first century or earlier beliefs, literally Iron Age philosophy with 21st century destructive technology. This, this on its face should, be, should seem untenable to us. Every person in this room has more access to information and scientific knowledge and, and just what is now basic common sense than the authors of the Bible and the Quran. In fact, there's not a person in this room who has ever met a person whose worldview is, so, is as narrow just by, by the sheer time in which they appeared in history as the worldviews of Abraham or Moses or Jesus or Muhammad. And until we grapple with that fact and honestly talk about the, the, the honestly commit ourselves to a 21st century conversation about the possibilities of human well-being, we're just going to be at sea and we're going to be trying, we're, we're going to be trying to figure out whether we should pass laws about gay marriage and whether we should ban blasphemy at the UN and whether we should allow newspapers to print cartoons about the Prophet Muhammad. And we're going to just be bewildered by the, the relentless certainties of people who are obviously lying to themselves. The fact that you have Christians having deep experiences of peace, and you have Muslims, and you have atheists, and you have Buddhists, it proves that there's a deeper principle that should be talked about in a non-sectarian way that is not held hostage by Iron Age, Age literature. The first thing you want to do in the spirit of intellectual honesty is admit ignorance, not claim that you, by closing your eyes, can realize your identity with the entire cosmos and, and you, the origin of the, uh, you go get before the Big Bang with your, your, your unguarded intuitions. The first thing to say up front is just that religious moderation is better than fundamentalism. There's no doubt about that. Religious moderates don't fly planes into buildings. Religious moderates don't organize their lives around apocalyptic prophecy, and that's a very good thing. But religious moderation has some real problems. The first is that it gives cover to fundamentalism. Because, because religious moderates have, have made it taboo to criticize faith. They want faith respected. They want the whole project of being religious, being identified as a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, to be respected. That it, it, is, it is impossible to, to call into question that this basic project, that the, the ethical tenability of, of raising a child to believe he's a Christian as opposed to anything else. And under the cover of this respect, we, we are now powerless to say the very harsh and necessary things about religious extremism that, that we need to say, it, because it, it, is, it is taboo. You have to respect faith. Where else in our discourse do we play by these rules? Well, when was the last time anyone in this room was admonished to respect another person's beliefs about history or geography or engineering or medicine? We, we do not respect people's beliefs. We evaluate their reasons. If, if my reasons are good, are good enough, you will helplessly believe what I believe. That is what it is to be a rational human being. Reasons are contagious. If I came on the stage and said that the Holocaust never happened, you would be under no burden whatsoever to respect my beliefs. And we don't respect the beliefs of people who think Elvis is still alive, I and mean, the people who make all those crazy pilgrimages to Graceland. These people do not get invited to sit on our boards of directors. They don't become presidents of universities. I mean, that, that, is, that, that is all well and good, except when you change the, the, the subject to God, and then all bets are off. Then the sky's the limit. You can be certain with zero evidence 
and, and respected for it. It is taboo to push the, push the conversation into criticism of your beliefs. Or take another belief that really should be, this should just be a curiosity to us until you see its consequences in the world, that the Catholic idea that condom use is somehow immoral. This is, this is a, a genuinely ludicrous idea. I, I can assure you that the, the powers of the human brain are insufficient to provide a good argument for this. But map this onto sub-Saharan Africa, where literally millions, something like three and a half, four million people, die each year from the spread of AIDS. And what you have there are Catholic ministers literally preaching the sinfulness of condom use in villages where the only information about condom use is the representation of the ministry. I mean, it seems to me that the, the time for respecting beliefs of this sort is long past. This, this is genocidal stupidity. It, it, is really, it is criminal negligence, criminal negligence of a sort that we would not tolerate in any other institution, yet the Vatican cannot be criticized to the degree that it should because it's the Vatican, and there's, there is a overarching taboo around criticizing religious faith. Strangely, the reason people rise to the defense of God is not that there's so much evidence that God exists, but that they believe that belief in God is the only intellectual framework for an objective morality. Now, the sense is that without the conviction that moral truths exist, that, that words like right and wrong and good and evil actually mean something, humanity will just lose its way. Uh, that's the fear, and I, I actually share that fear. Uh, I've come to believe that this, this concern that many religious people have of the erosion of secular morality is not an entirely empty one. Now, I once spoke at a, a, an academic meeting on these themes, and I, and I said, as I will say tonight, that once we understand morality in terms of human well-being, we'll be able to make strong claims about which behaviors and, and ways of life are, are good for us and which aren't. Uh, and I cited as an example the sadism and misogyny of the Taliban as, as an example of a, a, a worldview that, that was less than perfectly conducive to human flourishing. And after my remarks, I, I fell into debate with another uh, invited speaker. And this is more or less exactly how our conversation went. She said, how could you ever say that forcing women to wear burqas is wrong from the point of view of science. I said, well, because I think it's pretty clear that right and wrong relate to human well-being, and it's just as clear that forcing half the population to live in cloth bags and beating them or killing them when they try to get out is not a way of maximizing human well-being. And she said, well, that's just your opinion. And I said, okay, well, let's make it even easier. Let's say we found a culture that was literally removing the eyeballs of every third child okay, at birth. Would you then agree that we had found a culture that was not perfectly maximizing human well-being? And she said, it would depend on why they were doing it. <laughs> so after my eyebrows returned from the back of my head, uh, I said, okay, well, let's say they're doing it for religious reasons. Let's say they have a scripture which says every third should walk in darkness or some such nonsense. Okay. And then she said, well, then you could never say that they were wrong. Okay, and so I, I, you should know, I was talking to someone who has a deep background in science and philosophy. She's actually since been appointed to the President's Council on, Council on Bioethics. She's one of 13 people advising President Obama on all of the ethical implications of advances in medicine and, and uh, related science and technology. And she had just delivered a perfectly lucid lecture on the moral implications of, of neuroscience for the courts. And she was especially concerned that we could be subjecting captured terrorists to lie detection neuroimaging technology. Uh, and she viewed this as, as really an unconscionable violation of cognitive liberty. Uh, so on the one hand, her moral scruples were very finely calibrated to, to recoil from the slightest perceived misstep in ethical terms in our war on terror. And yet she was quite willing to forgive some primitive culture its fondness for removing the eyeballs of children in its religious rituals. 
And she seemed to me quite terrifyingly detached from the very real suffering of, of millions of women in Afghanistan at this moment. So uh, I see this double standard as a problem. And strangely, this is precisely the erosion of basic common sense that many religious people are worried about. I hope it'll be clear to you at the end of this hour that religion is not an answer to this problem. Okay, belief in God is not only unnecessary for a universal morality, it's, 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 it is itself a source of moral blindness. People want to be happy. They know the difference between happiness and suffering. They want to, they, they want to feel a part of a community. They want to feel the best they've ever felt and, the be and better, than, better than they've ever felt. And they, they constantly notice that life makes that difficult. It's the beliefs that console us about what happens after death are a, a, a obviously a response to that circumstance. And one thing people have found to do is tell each other a story that death is an illusion, that we all get together at the right hand of Jesus after we die. That, that does the trick for a lot of people and people are mightily attached to that story. And, and, but that story is really, both, both it's in its products and in, and in the way of getting there, the antithesis of the scientific frame of mind. And we just can't conflate them. And we have to notice when we're lying to ourselves and when we're lying to our children. And we have to notice that there's a liability to pretending to know things we don't know.